Hello, I'm Jim McCann. I'm the uh, chairman of Worth Media Group, and we're privileged uh, this morning to have as our guest for the quarterly presentation of the Atlas Merchant Capital Economic Update, uh, Bob Diamond, the founder and chairman of Atlas Merchant Capital, and Larry Cantor, who's the operating partner and chief economist of At Atlas Merchant Capital. So it's a, an interesting time, uh, gentlemen. Uh, lots going on. These, these quarterly updates have been fantastic. They've been prescient and, and a great benefit to so many of us who've been privileged to hear them. So uh, I look forward to uh, hearing where, where you think we stand this morning with all the tumult going on around us. Bob, uh, the experience you've had running money center banks and being a veteran of Wall Street for so many years and now for the last uh, nine years as a founder and chair of uh, Atlas Merchant Capital, you have a unique perch. Uh, and uh, I wonder if you might open us up with your overall observations and then uh, turn it over to Larry who can take us through the nitty gritty of what he sees happening and what we might anticipate will happen next. Well, Jim, Larry and I talked about this and we're gonna focus today on what's going on in the US. I think that is the blueprint um, and everything else going on around the world is somewhat of a derivative of that. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Larry when uh, after his Fed days, uh, he was chief economist at JP Morgan. We convinced him to join us at Barclays in the early days of building Barclays Capital. And I saw what Larry did in building a research and economics function, particularly when he had the opportunity to integrate the Lehman platform into what we were doing at Barclays. It was absolutely number one in the world. I think the reason people should be paying attention, Jimmy, to this every quarter is that Larry puts things in perspective that even non-finance professionals can understand. And even better than that, Larry builds on those themes each quarter, going through what's changed, what hasn't changed, what's accelerated. So this That's is- That's what we hear all the time. Larry's able to interpret it for us exactly. and make sense of it all. Larry, over to you. Uh, thanks, Bob, those kind words. Uh, well, everybody knows by now that we're on the downside of this business cycle, whether it ends up being designated as a recession or not. The important questions are how long it'll last and how bad it'll get. I'm more optimistic on the severity than I am on the length. You know, it's no surprise we're in this situation. I mean, government stimulus, both fiscal and monetary, was far greater during the pandemic than any seen, anything seen in modern history. And that includes the financial crisis, which was dubbed the Great Recession. I mean, there's no doubt that very large and immediate public support was necessary to avoid a disastrous economic and market outcome, but it turned out to be excessive. Just for perspective, I mean, during the financial crisis, the government spent around 700 billion, whereas this time it splurged to the tune of over 5 trillion. That was around 25% of GDP. On the monetary side, in the financial crisis, the Fed bought about three and a half trillion in bonds over six years, uh, whereas this time around, it bought nearly five trillion after the span of only two years, which is just an amazing amount of liquidity. And the result was two years of a rising tide of income and liquidity that basically lifted all boats. And by that, I mean the economy, Asset prices ranging from stocks to bonds to houses to commodities, and finally to consumer price inflation, which, as you all know, has reached levels we haven't seen in 40 years. You know, it was inevitable that we were going to have to pay for all this largesse at some point. On the fiscal side, we've already experienced a huge tightening simply due to the expiration of all those COVID relief programs. The U.S. budget deficit as a percent of GDP came in at around 12% in fiscal 2021. This year, it's coming in at around 4%. That's eight percentage points of GDP down, although this also reflects higher tax revenues associated with the economic recovery and strong gains in, in capital markets. As for monetary policy, it was always clear that the Fed you know, wouldn't keep it zero forever and would stop buying bonds at some point. But the payback we're experiencing now is greater than it could have been because the Fed was late in recognizing that the rise in inflation was not temporary. So inflation began to accelerate at the beginning of 2021, 
by the fall of that year, there were ample signs that it wasn't coming down anytime soon. The Fed basically didn't take the punch bowl away just as the party was getting going. That was the old maxim. Uh, the same is true for many other central banks around the world. And as a result, they're all pursuing pro-cyclical policies because they've been behind the curve. So they're tightening even as their economies are slowing. Combined with the effects of the war in Ukraine and ongoing COVID issues in some parts of the world, China in particular, tighter fiscal and monetary policies are producing a huge global economic slowdown and plunging financial markets. Europe's probably in recession already. China seems to be growing at around a 3% pace. That's the lowest in 30 years, except for 2020 when the pandemic, pandemic shut down its economy. While the US economy has also slowed significantly, it's holding up, in my opinion, remarkably well, considering all the headwinds it's facing. A along with the global economic slowdown and the huge fiscal drag, interest rates, energy prices, and the US dollar have all risen sharply since the beginning of the year. To some extent, uh, this reflects the fact that the U.S. is the world's biggest producer of food and energy and therefore is more insulated from the war in Ukraine. Just for example, the price of natural gas in Europe is some eight to nine times as expensive as it is in the U.S. But it's also because of several other factors. Uh, one, excess demand for labor has allowed employment to grow solidly, even with zero GDP growth. The massive amount of liquidity that the Fed injected over the past couple of years is still providing some cushion for financial markets. And finally, the collapse in gasoline prices since mid-June is bolstering household purchasing power. Looking forward, the sharp rise in the dollar will help ease inflation and slow growth in the US, whereas it's the opposite for other countries, which will put even more pressure on their central banks to hike rates. We've already seen currency interventions in Japan and China. And as I'm sure you all know, the Bank of England intervened uh, last week to shore up bond prices and, and they delayed plans to shrink their balance sheet. But while the US economy is held up better than most, things are likely to get worse before they get better because there is more restraint in the pipeline. Uh, the expected Fed funds rate for year end was three and a quarter percent sorry, three and a half as recently as a month ago, and is now over 4%. Bond yields have jumped. 30-year uh, fixed mortgage rates, for example, are now over 6.8%. That's up from three and a quarter at the start of the year. The dollar's moved up another 5% over the last month, which will continue to make exports more expensive and imports cheaper. And finally, uh, as a reason for the fact that there's more coming, the sectors most sensitive to interest rate hikes uh, that are already in decline, namely housing and non-essential retail goods, don't appear to have bottomed yet. And there are other sectors, mainly in services, that tend to be laggards. There's an important silver lining, though. I believe inflation has peaked in the US, although this is far from a consensus view and is not priced into markets. Headline inflation numbers are already decelerating. The Fed, it's true, targets core inflation, but I think headline inflation is underrated. I mean, it's the most important to consumers because food and energy are staples in everybody's budget, and they're the most visible prices. You can't drive anywhere without seeing big gas station signs. So they play a major role in shaping inflation expectations. You look at um, headline inflation, both CPI and the PCE, that's a personal consumption expenditure deflator that the Fed targets, and both peaked in June at 9% for the CPI, 7% for the PCE. The most recent readings for those two are 8.2 and 6.2, so almost a percentage point below the peaks. That said, much of the deceleration so far is due to the turnaround in energy prices, which is probably why there's little confidence that it's going to persist. But I'd argue there's compelling signs that inflation is already heading down outside of energy, at least in the US. 
uh, I'm confident that prices for goods, so this is goods price inflation, has peaked and it's falling now. The producer price index, this is what producers are paying for their inputs, is a leading indicator of goods prices. And prices of intermediate goods, these are used to process finished goods, are leading indicators of the PPI. So prices of intermediate goods accelerated to nearly a 40% pace on a three-month annualized basis toward the end of last year. That was a warning sign of higher inflation that many people missed. They've since decelerated sharply to a point where in the last couple of months, intermediate goods prices are now actually falling. Not just inflation decelerating, they're falling. Finished goods prices are following suit with a lag as they always do, having already decelerated from double digit gains to single digit, and they're heading down further. Anecdotally, I'm sure you've noticed prices are already falling over a wide range of goods from energy, to lumber, to copper, to steel, to semiconductors, and even used cars. The turnaround in goods prices reflects both easing global supply chains, as well as shifting consumer spending patterns. Delivery times in the purchasing manager survey uh, is a good measure of, are a good measure of supply bottlenecks, and they've declined sharply. Meanwhile, costs of shipping goods globally has collapsed. They've fallen by more than half from a year ago. Meanwhile, consumer spending on goods declined for the second straight month in August, coming off the pandemic surge when the government doled out billions of dollars in income support, just as people weren't spending money on services such as travel, entertainment, going out to restaurants, gyms, spas. Now we're on the reverse side of that shift as people re-engage in services that were previously off limits. Um, not surprisingly, as goods inflation is now falling, the prices of services have been accelerating as service industries move back toward full capacity. Just the numbers, core services inflation, uh, X energy fell. But so core service inflation fell from 3% pre-pandemic to one and a quarter percent by early 2021. And we're running at a pace of just over 6% in August, which is the last number we've got. But there's good reason to believe that inflation in services is also turning down, although it's not gonna become obvious for several months. Um, as I noted earlier, the US economy is slowing dramatically and there's more to come. But on a more granular note, and I don't wanna get into the weeds too much here, the cost of shelter, so what's shelter? It's basically housing costs, excluding utilities and furnishings is starting to fall, even though it won't show up in the official inflation numbers right away. Inflation in services is dominated by shelter costs, which account for about a third of the total CPI and over 40% of core inflation. The housing industry is already in recession. Existing home sales fell in August for the seventh straight month. They're down a cumulative 26%. Um, also, um, Single-family home permits, which are a leading indicator of new home construction, have fallen for six straight months. Mortgage rates have doubled. Household income has been falling in inflation-adjusted terms. As a result of all this, home prices began to fall in July for the first time in over a decade, although the BLS measures shelter costs looking at rent. <clears throat> Based on Zillow and apartment list indices, rents have begun to drop as well. But the shelter component of official inflation indices is measured in a way that doesn't capture changes on a timely basis. The BLS, believe it or not, uses the average change in rents over the previous six months as the monthly change. So declines in shelter costs that have already begun to occur are, are unlikely to show up in the inflation me measures for at least several months. The Fed's official inflation target, of course, is the core PCE, and the August figures released just Friday were not encouraging. PCA, PC, uh, core, core PCE prices rose a greater than expected six-tenths of a percent on the month. They were flat in July uh, and accelerated on a year-on-year -year basis from 47 to 4.9%. 
Markets, not surprisingly, reacted poorly to these figures, but it's worth noting that core inflation uh, has probably peaked as well, just like headline. I mean, you look at it, uh, even though a convincing downtrend isn't yet apparent, both core CPI and PC inflation figures have consistently been below their March peaks. The March peak for the PCE was 5.4%. As I just said, the most recent number was 49 of course, having said all this, the key question for markets is what the Fed makes of all this, not what I think. As everybody knows, the Fed's engineered a dramatic shift in its policy, and just as importantly in its rhetoric. After insisting that inflation was temporary all the way through the beginning of this year, the Fed has hiked rates at the fastest pace since the 1980s. Nobody was surprised when it raised rates by another 75 basis points a couple of weeks ago, making for a cumulative increase this year of 300 basis points. But Powell's statements afterwards in the FOMC forecasts suggested a much more hawkish policy stance than had been expected. The FOMC forecast for the funds rate at year end was raised 100 basis points from 3.4 to 4.4 and also pointed to further hikes next year. These forecasts were above what markets had priced in previously, and prices of both stocks and bonds fell sharply after. But I'm not so sure the Fed's gonna deliver on these forecasts. As we said before, the Fed was late recognizing that inflation was a problem, and that damages its credibility which Powell and his colleagues are determined to restore. But more importantly, there was a sense over the summer that the Fed's message was just not getting through. After its first 75 base, basis point rate hike in mid-June, bringing the funds rate a cumulative 150 basis points at that point in a mere three months, the S&P actually rose 17% and the 10-year treasury yield fell nearly 100 basis points over the following two months. That that kind of market reaction was totally inconsistent uh, with a tightening regime designed to lower inflation. And if it persisted, it meant that the Fed would have to hike rates even more than would have otherwise been necessary. Lower stock prices and higher bond yields, along with a stronger dollar, are part of the process through which the Fed tightening sl slows the economy. What Powell is doing now is trying to maximize the effect of Fed tightening through rhetoric, which implicitly has become now one of the Fed's policy tools. He's acknowledged that future Fed action is data dependent, and he's even shunning foreign forward guidance for the time being. Based on the evidence in this business cycle, I don't think we should believe that the Fed has any better insight into when and how quickly inflation will come down and the labor market will weaken than the market or economists at large do. I believe the Fed will look at a wide range of inflation measures as well as what drives them when deciding on its policy stance. It'll also look closely at the labor market since labor costs are a major input into the prices of services where both activity and price pressures are now strongest. I doubt that the September labor market report, which is coming out this Friday, is gonna provide much solace since weekly jobless claims have turned down recently, which suggests that the labor market remains very tight. So my guess at this point is that the Fed will hike another 100 to 125 basis points over the last two meetings of the year, bringing the year-end funds rate to four or four and a quarter percent, which is slightly below the Fed FOMC dot points. By then, there should be growing evidence that inflation has peaked and is heading down including core inflation, and that the labor market is weakening. As a result, I wouldn't be surprised if the Fed goes on hold for an extended period around the beginning of next year. It's worth remembering monetary policy affects the economy and especially inflation with a lag, and the Fed has always operated that way. As for the extent of damage to the economy in this cycle, I don't foresee anything nearly as bad as the financial crisis. Recessions, I've always characterized recessions as corrections for some kind of excessive behavior. This time around, the excess was mainly in the public rather than the private sector. 
those excesses are now being corrected by much tighter policies. Overall, the household and business sectors maintain healthy balance sheets and show little sign of excessive leverage. And the US banking system is on sound footing. Even in housing, builders this time around, unlike the financial crisis, did not overbuild. In fact, you could argue they underbuilt. But since the economy is not crashing, we will probably need an extended period of very sluggish growth, or maybe none at all for a few quarters, to weaken the labor market sufficiently and get inflation down to low single digits on a sustainable basis. A 4% funds rate is restrictive, but not terribly so. I think the Fed will leave it there for quite a while to put the labor market back in balance and to ensure that the decline inflation won't reverse. There are good reasons to believe that shortages in the labor market will begin to ease soon, given the ongoing slowdown in the economy. We're already hearing about hiring freezes and layoffs, especially in retail and tech, as business is slowing and labor costs are rising. Turning very briefly, briefly to the markets, uh, in my view, the decline in stock prices of around 25% from their peak doesn't seem far off with where they should be. It's worth noting that inflation shifted from mainly, this is an old term, demand pull, which was good for profits, to cost push coming from the labor market, which will put further pressure on profit margins. That said, given the superior economic performance of the US economy, its stock market remains attractive on a relative basis. Finally, as for bond yields, I'd expect the 10-year treasury yield to end up with a four-handle, and I think inflation may well settle a bit above the Fed's target of 2% next year, say around 3%. I don't believe the Fed will pursue a policy of extreme restrictiveness that would put the economy into a much bigger contraction just to get it down to two. And let me end it there, uh, hand, hand it back to uh, Jim, if we have time for some questions. We do indeed, Larry, and thanks for that. That's a, really a lot to digest there and just to poke at it a little bit. Uh, it's interesting that, that you think that the Fed has another tool that's heretofore not spoken about a lot, which is sentiment and yep. the, the use of rhetoric. And uh, is it? do you think, Larry, it's true that back in the spring of 20, that the, the institution of the Fed, and in particular, this Fed, uh, saved the economic world? In 2000, in this cycle. Yes, uh, yeah, I think the, Fed the, and the onset of COVID. Yeah, I, I think we needed very big and very quick action, for sure. I mean, we could have, I mean, businesses would have, so many businesses would not, not have survived and so many, we would have had food lines like in the depression. I mean, there was yep. no doubt. We so the institution of the Fed served its purpose and indeed opened up the floodgates, acted quickly, buyer of last resort, were there for it and saved us from plummeting. Right. The point was they didn't then react quickly enough to easing on those pressures. And I think the, the Bob, uh, you know the world, uh, the political climate as well as anyone, it seems that the world, all the uh, political leaders of the world now get it which is you can overspend, pass it on to the next generation, and the electorate will be happy. Yeah, but, but just, not. Jim, let me just say one thing before Bob gets it, and that is, yes, they, they had to do what they did, but it was so much bigger that it turned, especially the last fiscal package, and the Fed was late. I mean, so yes, they did the right thing. They saved the world. But, you know, in retrospect, even at the time, for a long time, it seemed... Too much. That's it. So anyway, Bob, sorry. Bob during COVID, we, we began to look at the UK as a, a bellwether. And what was happening there a few weeks later, a few months later would happen here. I hope that's not the case from an economic point of view right now. You know, the UK and European markets better than most. Uh, what, what do you think happens next uh, in the UK? And is that a bellwether for us here? So there was a lot of talk about is this a currency crisis with the pound versus the dollar over the last couple of weeks when it moved from kind of 130 to 105 ish? The real issue, Jim, is that in the financial crisis, sterling was at 220. And between the mismanagement of the, of the local banks during the financial crisis, followed by Brexit, followed by COVID, followed 
by the most recent behavior, including, by the way, the strength of the dollar, 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 which is, which is, which is real. I think the lesson learned in the UK is that something we've all learned, and one of the reasons I've loved being in the financial services is you can't fight the markets. And the chancellor, um, to be perfectly frank, made a real rookie mistake, which is to announce 150 billion debt financed energy policy without sitting down with the banks, the asset managers and the buyers of gilts. And that's what really happened. It was kind of a arrogant attitude toward this is right. Because the truth is he, he announced some things that were really substantive, you know, lower corporate taxes, uh, immigration policies that would, in, would take some of the heat out of uh, labor supply, less bureaucracy around infrastructure investments and, and, uh, and real estate investments. So it was all lost. And I think what Larry had, had described about um, the Fed as well, they're somewhat um, you know, responsible for that having gone too far. And I think the rhetoric you're talking about is the newfound respect um, that the Fed even has in terms of taking into consideration the market reactions and keeping the markets aware. So um, I think the UK has a lot of challenges ahead of it. Um, but when you look at the overall situation, I'd be a better buyer than, than seller right now. Hmm. Uh, Larry, you mentioned how since June, energy prices are down substantially. We saw over the weekend the announcement that OPEC is going to meet to try and uh, impose restrictions on production to raise prices. That seems uh, to the layman here that that would be beneficial uh, during an electoral uh, period here in the U.S., that rising energy prices would, uh, would be detrimental to the, the party in power. And uh, it seems to me that it would be, it seems beneficial to Putin, who's so dependent on energy prices. Now we see the work of our good friend and partner, uh, Dean uh, uh, Sonnenfeld up at Yale, working with Stephen Tian, uh, publishing a lot over the last uh, week or so about what's really going on in the Russian economy and how the collapse in energy prices is really hurting them. What's going on here? What is likely to happen? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what OPEC's going to decide, although you've seen just, Jim, in the last week, oil prices sort of crept, creeping up. They they bottomed at 76, I think, and now they're back, you know, in the in the uh, sort of mid 80s. So people are already, the market's already preparing for this. My question, I don't know the answer. I mean, Russia is now part of this thing uh, with OPEC, and I can't imagine that Russia is going to cut their output because it's already down. In other words, there's the price and then there's the the, the amount. So uh, it's hard to say what they're going to do. They, I, I'm sure they're going to cut output somewhat given this dramatic drop. And, you know, if it goes up five dollars, ten dollars, that's still pe people were worried it was going to go to one fifty at some point. And so but you uh, talked about how the gas prices in Europe eight or nine times what they are here. Right. Uh, we know from Professor Sonnenfeld's work here that Russia doesn't have that much flexibility in where they export to. And right. they have the highest production costs in the world at $50, $51 a barrel, for example. Yep. Uh, can, can, does a, a, a cut in production, in fact, benefit them at all? Yeah, that, that, that's what I don't know. I don't know if this is really going to help Russia because I can't imagine. I mean, OPEC will want them. They, they want everybody to abide by that. I can't imagine Russia. Russia doing that. I said, you know, there's no doubt, Jim, this is this is really hurting big time in Europe, these energy costs. Now, two, there's two offsets here. One, they built these floating LNG terminals off the coast incredibly fast. And they're over 80% in capacity of what they usually are at this for for gas altogether, which is amazing. Sure is. That'll only last for two or three months, and the winter's probably going to last longer than that. So they'll need more than that. Um, and the second thing is that you probably noticed that European governments, Germany and France already, are and, and the UK, supply, supplying supports, income supports for this rise in in, uh, in uh, But Bob, you said they did Egypt. that with, with, by borrowing again. And without right. consideration of what impact would be on markets, uh, that uh, it's a it's it's a temporary thing that could have negative consequences. Right. Let me finish up with a, a question that would be on a lot of folks' minds, certainly mine. 
and those around me, we just saw a hurricane uh, devastate the southwest of Florida and impact uh, both North and South Carolina. Larry, uh, uh, what, happen what happens economically to an area, to a country that experiences tens of billions of dollars in losses like that? We know the human, uh, the human count on that is, is pretty horrific. There are still families that have nothing now, but stepping back and being cold analytical economists that you are, tell us what do we expect is the economic fallout from this human tragedy. I appreciate the introduction, Jim, because I don't want to sound callous about this. <laughs> you know, it, it, it is terrible in terms of loss of lives, property, homes, and all that stuff. I hate to say this, but what happens is, you, you, as you said, tens of billions. Our econ the U.S. economy is over $25 trillion. This is a blip. I don't think if it's a tenth of a percent of GDP in terms of losing growth. But oddly enough, ironically, and not to sound callous, when you have natural disasters, this happened with the pandemic in a way acted like a natural disaster. The yes. immediate effect, well, the pandemic was a little different because of jobs and stuff, but, and it was national rather than local, but the immediate effect is a loss mostly in wealth, property, that kind of thing, and of course, human lives. But we all focus not on wealth, but on GDP growth. <laughs> Oddly enough, it actually spurs GDP growth because all this stuff's going to have to be rebuilt. You're already yeah. seeing lots of money pouring in there and you're going to see more to these areas. So, and you've seen this with hurricanes in the past, with floods, with earthquakes, caused a lot of horrible human damage, a lot of property damage, but it actually lifts growth. As <laughs> How ironic. <laughs> ironic. Well, uh, Bob uh, Diamond, uh, Larry Cantor, thanks for sharing with us this quarter. Once again, your thoughts on what's going on in the world. I think we're all better equipped to make some sense of uh, what's happened, but more importantly, what's likely to happen. So thanks for sharing your, your thoughts and your wisdom with us today. Thanks, Jimmy. Thank thanks to work. <laughs>